this is it. Tom Woods, big kahuna here, New York Times bestseller. to American History, Senior Fellow at the Ludwig von Mises Institute. Yeah. Anyone heard of that? Subversives. Oh yeah, subversives. <laughs> Bachelor's degree from Harvard, Master's and PhD from Columbia University, and quite frankly, Liberty Superstar. Tom Woods. See how we're going, see how the momentum goes. Take but, the pie, Tom. Yeah, thank you, Michael. He's the organizer. <laughs> uh, really, let's see, I'll put my little watch here. Uh, that's going to work. I'm going to monitor the time. They got a little clock here. Okay, we'll use that. All right, well, first of all, thanks to the 10th Amendment Center. Thanks to all you guys. Thanks to WeRefuse.com and all the sponsors, everybody made this possible for us to be here defying conventional opinion. And to me, it was very heartwarming to see protesters outside today. That was actually a great development. Not only, not only because it made it easier to find which building we were having. We know we're over the target. Because honestly, right, these college campuses, I don't know where, where lot 12 is or what building it is. So, I don't know, people are angry over here. <laughs> so hey, thanks a lot. Appreciate that. But also because it means apparently we're being noticed, which is better than not being noticed. Yeah. Right? I would rather have an event, you know, that's where people are protesting than an event with 10, with 10 people and nobody even knows what's going on. And so I'm going to take a few of my initial minutes to address some of the arguments of the protesters. And I don't know if you can call it an argument, you can fit it on a three by five card, but I am going to try to address it. But first of all, I want to say thanks because I'm here, I'm so glad to have a chance to be here in New Hampshire. I grew up in Massachusetts. I realize that's a sore spot for some people. <laughs> all these jerks in Massachusetts screw up their own state and they want to move up. They, don't, they have no idea why the state is all screwed up. Oh, we've got to get out of crazy Massachusetts. Let's go impose the same stuff on, on New Hampshire. I'm sorry about that, okay? I'm sorry. No, really, you guys, no, you guys, when people talk about we have an immigration problem, New Hampshire. If only you could keep these rocky Yankees out of But anyway, I'm so thrilled to have a chance to come back. Because I lived in Massachusetts up until I was 21. And every other state I've lived in, I basically felt like a fish out of water. And to have a chance to come back here and go, go to North Andover, where I grew up. I went to North Andover High School. And get to eat a roast beef sandwich at Harrison's Roast Beef. These are all just extraordinary opportunities for me. You gotta check that out, Harrison's roast beef. Come on, no. nobody beats that sandwich, my friends. I want to say hello to Kim Stump and Cheryl Carnes, a couple of my mother's friends who made it here, so I appreciate that very much. But okay, enough of that. Let's talk about the, the protests that we just had. First of all, Michael Bolden, who runs the 10th Amendment Center, is the best guy to address this kind of situation. He went right out there, and immediately he was Mr. Nice Guy and talked to them, and he kind of almost won them over, and then admitted to them, by the way, I'm the organizer of <laughs> Oh my gosh, we're just about to like you. You seem so nice and likable and whatever. He had them so tied up in knots, they didn't know what to say by the time, by the time that was all done. Because he said, you know, look, I started the 10th Amendment Center not because Barack Obama got elected. I started under George W. Bush. Because what we care about are these principles. See, unlike some people, we actually have principles that don't go away for four-year intervals. We actually have principles that we stick with. Regardless, regardless of what the letter happens to be in parentheses next to the guy's name. So again, this leads to, oh my gosh, how could this be? Because they think we're all... Unfortunately, the protesters who may have had decent hearts and might be decent people, they are part of the problem in the sense that they are living inside this nightmare box that the rest of us are trying to break out of. And that's the box where you are allowed to rest somewhere along this glorious range. Somewhere between Joe Biden and like Bob Dole. Like, that's the whole 
range of acceptable opinions. So they just assume that if you're not happy with Bob Dole, or you're not happy with Joe Biden, you must like the other one, and so on. So they assume, well, gee, we're not, not big fans of Obama. So that means we therefore support whatever plastic man the other guys are going to throw at us. Not necessarily. I think that's not a safe assumption. But that's where they live. You have two choices. It's either this schmo or that one. And we're trying to suggest that there just might be a third choice. That maybe our choices are not just Hillary Clinton or Mitch McConnell. Maybe the answers to our problems lie somewhere outside this three-inch spectrum that we're all supposed to dutifully confine ourselves to. No. We've got to break out of this box, crush it into the ground, and then set it up. one of the protesters. One protester had a sign that said, we the people doesn't mean pick and choose. I agree with that completely. I completely agree with that. The federal government shouldn't be picking and choosing which parts of the Constitution it's going to abide by. I agree completely. But that's the system we have. That's the system we have now. For example, and believe me, I'm going to try to keep this to just one example, because this would be a whole, whole weekend seminar of examples, but Here's one of my favorite cases. Well, they say, look, the Supreme Court will keep an eye on everything for it. <laughs> Don't worry about that. If anything's wrong, the Supreme Court will put it right. Mm. Well, here's an example. Somebody was talking about the, the Commerce Clause earlier. This, this is a clause by which they more or less authorize themselves to do whatever they feel like doing. For 60 years, the Supreme Court failed to find one federal law unconstitutional on Commerce Clause grounds. They stretched it to incorporate pretty much any aspect of human activity. Until 1995, there was a government claim that became so absurd that even the normally indulgent Supreme Court had to say, now just wait a minute, now, this is a little too much. And that was the U.S. versus Lopez case, which involved the Federal Gun-Free School Zones Act of 1990. It says you couldn't bring a firearm with an X number of feet of a school. Well, 40 states already had a law like that on the books anyway at that time. The federal government goes and opposes this thing. And here with their grounds, you might say, well, gee, where do they get the constitutional authority to do that? Like, it's not enough to say, hey, I think that would be a super law. It doesn't matter if it's a super law or a crummy law. First, you have to ask, do they have the authority to do it? And here was the answer they gave before the Supreme Court. This is the answer the federal government gives. Well, here's why we have the authority to regulate guns in the school zone. Because suppose kids are in a school zone where they fear there might be guns. Then, they're going to become nervous about guns. And if they're nervous, they won't be able to concentrate. And if they can't concentrate, they won't be able to learn. And if they don't learn, then when they go out into the job market, they won't be able to produce as much. And when we don't produce as much, this impairs interstate commerce. <laughs> And so finally the court said, that has just too many steps in that argument. Like, this, this is just stupid. And so some people thought, a revolution is brewing. The court is going to become sane all of a sudden. No, it was just that one case. Then they went right back to the usual, usual nonsense. But that's how the, that's what, talk about picking and choosing. Well, they're just going to do whatever they want to do. And that's, that's what we have to live with. Let me remind you also of something that many of you in this room know, but hardly anybody in the country knows. What about Wisconsin in the 1850s, defying the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, on the grounds that just because there happens to be a Fugitive Slave Clause in the Constitution does not mean that, therefore, it's constitutionally acceptable to do absolutely anything whatsoever to return runaway slaves. And Wisconsin's legislature said, no, this law is unconstitutional, and therefore it is void and of no force. And their state Supreme Court said the same thing, and they heroically refused to comply. And then the Supreme Court said, in Abelman versus Booth, Wisconsin can't just pick and choose whatever it wants. So isn't that interesting? It kind of uses the phrase of our protester. Wisconsin can't pick and choose. Wisconsin's going to return those runaway slaves to their masters. Is that what the protesters would have been saying in 1858? Hey, Wisconsin, you can't pick and choose. Sorry, sorry, sir, you've got to go back to your master. Is that what they would have said? Yes, yeah, exactly. Well, I'm, yeah, it's a rhetorical question. <laughs> but 
they've got to ask the themselves curriculum. questions like this. And if they're expecting to hear questions like this in their third grade classroom, they got another thing coming. Nobody gets taught stuff like this. What do we all get taught? Well, the states are evil and stupid, which, you know, let's face it, many of them are. <laughs> but that anybody who wants to assert state authority against the federal government is obviously a perverse idiot who wants to bring back slavery and oppression. That's what you get in school. I don't blame these people for believing that at, at some level. I'd be shocked if they believed anything else. What I blame them for is persisting in this ignorance when information to the contrary is abundantly available all around you. Yeah. In fact, do you know where we had our last Nullify Now event? I believe you in suspense while I take it to walk now. In Cincinnati, at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, a major anti-slavery event at the Underground Railroad Freedom Center. This would make every one of these protesters' heads explode. Like, what? Yeah. I thought all you people supported slavery. Yeah, well, again, I think we need to think a little more clearly. Probably in 2011, most people deserve the benefit of the doubt, assuming they don't support slavery. So. Why don't you follow that line of argument? What I'm particularly happy about is in, in uh, Kentucky, there is a Tea Party candidate for governor named Phil Moffat, who is urging these principles very vigorously. One of them is, he's arguing that hemp, which is a product that the founding fathers were quite familiar with, produced a lot of products out of it, and said an oppression on Kentucky farmers that they can't produce it, and so he wants to bring about hemp nullification. And I find this interesting because now that puts these so-called misnamed progressives in a bit of a bind. So they kind of like hemp, but they don't like nullification. So what are they going to spin the bottle? Like how are they going to decide where they come down? Because that'll be fun to watch. But let me, you know, I don't want to dwell on these people for, for, for too long. Because again, you know, they're just repeating what their seventh grade teacher told them. You know, this is what this is what was put in their heads. I don't expect much much better. What I want to do is just go over briefly the basic case for what it is that, that we stand for with regard to nullification. Now this is stuff, again, that you're not going to get on television, except from Judge Napolitano. Yeah. And you're not going to... You're not going to get it on radio, that's for sure. Uh, all the people who pose as the great patriots on the radio, they won't touch this thing with a 10-foot pole. Even though it's going on, there are state legislatures that are getting interested in it, it's like it's not even happening. We are living in, truly in an Orwellian world. I mean, you know, you can hear Mike Church talk about it, the guy you should all be listening to in the morning on Sirius XM from 6 to 9 a.m. on your drive. You listen to Mike Church, there you'll get an education, and he's funny. Like, he really is good at what he's doing. Mike Church is very good on this, and the sit-in host for Rush Limbaugh is very good, Walter Williams, who oh, has courageously <laughs> But basically it works like this. Okay, this is basically the logic of it. The states came before the union. Now, uh, now, of course, there's a longer version of the story that you might find in a certain book called Nullification. <laughs> it might be available for purchase here. Okay, check, the, check the tables. I got my wife here with me, uh, helping me out with the book sale, so don't feel like the line would be too long. If you want to, want to have a moment. But what I'm going to do is just give you the outline, the skeletal outline. Basically, okay, the states come first, the states come before the union. We can see this in history, there's plenty of evidence of this. The Declaration of Independence, which comes before the union speaks of free and independent states that, and these are the exact words, have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. When the British acknowledged the independence of her former, former colonies, she did not acknowledge the independence of a single sovereign bloc. She acknowledged the independence of individual states, which she then went on to list one by one. Article 2 of the Articles of Confederation said that the states retain their sovereignty, freedom, and independence. Well, obviously, how could they retain their sovereignty, freedom, and independence unless they had those things to begin with? And when the Constitution was ratified, did they put it up to a big national vote? No, they went one by one to each of what James Madison called the parties to the Constitution, namely the states. Now, moreover, in the American system, no government is sovereign. The peoples of the states are the sovereigns. Now, for, for, for shorthand, we sometimes do indeed say state sovereignty, but what we're really saying there is the sovereignty of the peoples of the states. It is the peoples of the states who take their original sovereign powers and apportion them between the state governments and the federal government. 
They're not impairing their sovereignty. They're not giving up their sovereignty. They're exercising their sovereignty by apportioning powers among the states and the federal government. And since the peoples of the states are the sovereigns, then when the federal government exercises a power of dubious constitutionality on a matter of great importance, it is they themselves, the peoples of the states themselves, who are the proper disputants, as they review among themselves whether their own agent was indeed intended to possess the disputed power in the first place. No other arrangement makes sense. You don't ask your agent whether your agent was intended to have a particular power. You gave the agent the powers. Ask yourself. You don't ask him. Oh, please, oh, wise overlord, tell me if you were intended to have this particular power. <laughs> How do you think that question is going to come out? Well, you know what? We've thought about it. And the answer is yes. <laughs> Obviously, this doesn't work, and we wouldn't have been put in such an absurd situation uh, to begin with. That was Jefferson's argument. So the very nature of sovereignty and of the American system itself is such that the sovereigns must retain the power in the last resort to restrain an agent, namely the federal government, that they themselves created. The logic of our argument is completely irresistible. But then beyond simply looking at the matter logically and historically, we can refer to important documents, we can refer to historical evidence. And so, for example, James Madison, in his famous Virginia Report of 1800, says, you know what, because people were saying, the courts, the courts, the courts will put everything right. The demigods on the courts, who look down upon us from on high, they will put everything right. Madison said, you know what, I'm not really sure that's the case. He said, I don't think it's the case that we have fallible presidents and fallible congressmen, but infallible judges. He said, sorry, you're not going to convince me of that. He said, to the contrary, he says, Violations of the Constitution can be perpetrated by the President, by the Congress, but also the courts. And so therefore the states, the part, well, again, what he called the parties of the Constitution, must, in the very nature of things, have a defense mechanism against all of them. And then we can look back to the state ratifying conventions. That's where Madison says you look if you want to know what the Constitution means. What did these states believe they were getting themselves into? What were they told was the nature of the union that was being created? That's what binds, is the intent. In the same way of anybody involved with drafting a will, you have to know intent, or a contract, you have to know intent. What was the intent of the testator of this will? So what was the intent here? We look at the ratifying conventions, and in my nullification book, I've presented some of the excellent work of Professor Kevin Gutzman. Now, Kevin's a great guy because he's got a PhD in history and a law degree. So the law school people are too afraid to debate him because of historical knowledge, and the historians are too afraid to debate him because of his legal knowledge. So no one debates him, and he has free office hours you know, all the time where nobody disturbs him. He gets a lot of work done. Nobody dares touch this guy. I, and I've had the good fortune of meeting quite a few geniuses in the course of this sort of movement here, and I can say that Kevin is in the top five people I know. I'm so glad. Sure glad he's not on the other side, put it that way. And what he's done on the Virginia Ratifying Convention, there's no one in the country or the world who knows more about this than he does, and he's a thousand percent on our side. And basically, to make a long story short, what he says is this. You look at the records of the Virginia Ratifying Convention, and you find skeptics of the Constitution, like Patrick Henry, warning that there are certain open-ended phrases in this Constitution that will be misused, like the General Welfare Clause. Of course, he was right. That has been misused. But at the time, he was told by two people who were on the five-man commission whose job it was to draft the ratification instrument for Virginia. I mean, kind of important people. Edmund Randolph and George Nicholas. Randolph became uh, the first attorney general, and Nicholas became attorney general of Kentucky. I mean, these are not insignificant legal minds. And they said to Patrick Henry, no, 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 don't worry. This is a government of enumerated powers that will have only the powers expressly delegated to it. They use the word expressly. Have only the powers expressly delegated, and moreover, if this federal government ever tries to exercise a power that was not delegated to it, we in Virginia will be exonerated from that because we'll just say, well, when we entered the Constitution, we were only granting the powers that are listed. So if they're exercising something else, it doesn't apply to us. Hmm. Well, that doesn't sound too far from what we're saying. It doesn't from what we're demonized and condemned for saying. That's mainstream Virginian political thinking from 1788. 
And that's where Jefferson gets the idea of nullification. He's building on this tradition of thought from his own state. That's where he gets it. It wasn't that one day he woke up drunk and drafted the Kentucky resolutions, and then in a moment of hungover remorse said, oh my gosh, I can't believe I wrote this crazy document. No, he's building on an actual tradition of thought that's real. Now, how many kids in any state of the Union are being taught any of this in, in elementary school or junior high? Or something? Yeah, we could round it off to zero safely, right? But basically, I mean, how many of us, like, did we ever hear any of this? Nothing. Nothing. There is a version of the narrative that we're supposed to get, and it does not include this. So thankfully, a gloriously liberating thing about the Internet is, even though the gatekeepers of approved opinion do not want you to know, even the, the small facts I've had time to present you uh, today, we can get around them. We can get around them with blogs and websites and YouTubes and all kinds of things that totally defy and break out of the constraints of that box that is suffocating Americans. Now, having made this basically quick uh, case, I, I want to address some of the sort of complaints and criticisms that you might get. Well, this is all Southern and evil. <laughs> because, of course, those two words are synonymous. Right? We all know that all Southerners are evil, and anything they, they ever did or said was always just smokescreen for slavery. They can never be taken at their word. Okay, well, leaving that whole historical dispute aside, let's consider, first of all, how about the governor who said it was the role of the states in the last resort to protect the peoples of this country from an overbearing federal government. This was a governor in Connecticut in 1809. Didn't learn about that in school. How about the state legislature that passed a resolution in 1820 saying a majority of Americans believe in the principles of 1798 which include the power of state nullification. That was Ohio. Ohio was not part of the Southern Confederacy, as far as I know. How about Wisconsin, as we mentioned before, challenging the fugitive slave laws? Nullification was never used to support slavery. How could it be? What anti-slavery laws existed that would need to be nullified? Like that, that criticism doesn't even make sense. Like you're, you're at like a first grade level. And that's an insult to first graders when an argument like that is right. It doesn't even make sense. How could it even be? No, 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 this is all... Neo-Confederate, that's their, that's their word. Yeah. Oh, so therefore, we don't even need to refute it. We just utter this word and smear you, and we don't even need to answer it. Well, first of all, the president of the Southern Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, as he was leaving the U.S. Senate, denounced the principle of nullification in his speech, his farewell speech to the U.S. Senate, and then when South Carolina, which was the first state to secede, December 20th, 1860, they draft their statement of secession. What's one of their grievances? They're sick and tired of all this nullifying going on in the North. Ah, yeah, well, another thing we don't learn in school, so they can get away with this whole neo-Confederate thing. This is not neo-Confederate, any other kind of Confederate. It's not Northern or Southern. This is an American principle that has been resorted to by all sections of the Union for honorable purposes throughout the history of this republic. But again, the chances... It, Imagine a classroom. Imagine a classroom, and they get to this sort of period of history. Where's the nullification section? Where's any of this stuff? You hear crickets. It's like nothing. No, no, no mention of any of it at all. Now, because we all know what happens anytime you talk about the states, why you must be evil, you probably support slavery, and all these other things, I knew when you write a book like this with nullification on the cover, and it's stamped over a scene of Obama, Sign the health care bill, and all his cronies are right behind him. Now, first of all, it, it, it means people are going to be interested because even if you don't know what nullification is, you take a look at that cover and you say, whatever it is, I support it. <laughs> <laughs> but you write a book like that, and you know what's going to happen. I knew what my, my family's going to be put through, my name's going to be dragged in the mud. Like, I, mean, I knew that. I mean, and so I knew that what was going to happen was not that I'd be faced with a lot of really solid counter arguments from historians or I would be having a good intellectual exchange with something. No, no, no. I knew it would be, Woods is a bad guy, he's thinking outside the box, everybody, so block your ears, you're not permitted to hear this, it's not anywhere from Biden to McConnell, so block your ears, everybody, da-da-da-da-da, bad guy, bad guy. But you know what, there are enough independent thinkers, I believe, in this country, who when they hear something like that, think, why do they not want me to really hear what this guy is saying? Why is their entire response just one name they're calling it? 
And so I'm going to look this up. And so what I did was, before the book came out, I launched a preemptive strike against the people I knew were going to come at it. And that was in the form of a video. And I, I'm telling you, one thing I want you to commit to memory from my remarks today is the website interviewwithazombie.com. Okay. Those of you not applying, I want you to, I want you to visit this thing. Interviewwithazombie.com. Even if you've seen the video, go there because you can then you can see the bloopers where I, I, I couldn't do it without laughing. So if you see the bloopers, much funnier than the original video, it turns out. And now there's even a line of uh, my co-star, so-called in this video, has now produced a line of zombie gear. Somebody here is actually wearing a zombie t-shirt and everything. Basically the idea is this. I, I have this eight-minute YouTube, and it's called Interview with a Zombie. And I've got a professional voiceover guy at the beginning to make it seem like a real show. Welcome to Interview with a Zombie. And so that kind of almost seems real. And, and so what the idea is that this zombie has his own television talk show, which is, of course, very different from our regular television. Right? <laughs> so this zombie is going to show, he's going to interview me about nullification. Well, the point of the sketch is that every time I give an answer that's full of sound arguments, you might disagree with me, but the arguments at least have some substance to them, and I'm giving historical evidence and making various claims, instead of answering any of the claims, the zombie's response every time is to say something like, Slavery. This is, this is what you would hear from the Boston Globe, right? Or racism. I said, no, wait a minute. I just made this whole argument, and that, like, you're not even going to acknowledge that I made the argument. You're just going to keep on saying. So then I explain, all right, well, slavery never had anything to do with nullification, except to the extent that people fought against slavery with nullification. This faces him in no way. Slavery. So, of course, the idea is what would the difference be between this interview? And an interview with Keith Oberlin. <laughs> now, at least Keith Oberlin would have the ex or pardon me, at least the zombie has an excuse that he's a zombie. Although, you know, with Keith Oberlin, that certainly would explain a lot. <laughs> so I did this, and so now immediately people are laughing at these people. Before they even have a chance to attack me, they're already being laughed at. So whenever there's some smear job on me on one of these websites, Friends of mine go there and they just post the YouTube link and they call the person a zombie and they get like five or six responses. Zombie, zombie, poor guy doesn't know what hit him. It's absolutely so. So now there's a line of, of coffee mugs. And I, I make no money from this. My co-star made these up. The zombie himself and T-shirts and sweatshirts that have the zombie going like this and the word. Neo Confederate at the bottom. So we're already laughing at them before they even get started at us. That's something that we need to do more of. I mean, you get free publicity with YouTube. You can start a blog for free. You can buy a domain name for seven freaking bucks. I bought an interview with a zombie.com for seven bucks. <laughs> Why are we not using it? We should have a presence on the internet five times greater than what we've got already. We should get home and find out how do I start my YouTube channel? How do I clog the internet airwaves, so to speak, with the right views? And, and, and your video could be the thing that makes somebody look into this. Now, for more on this, of course, yes, there's the book, but I also did a website, just a page, that answers objections and gives you some of the arguments and the links that you need to defend this, and that's just statenullification.com. I can't believe that was available. I wasn't surprised an interview with a zombie.com was available. That I figured would be. But statenullification.com, I bought that thing seven bucks. Incredible. But let's move on, because what I want to talk about now is... You know, we've, we've all got our own reasons for being here. And a lot of people are single-issue people. Like for some people, they believe in locally controlled agriculture and they hate federal regulations, or it's, they, it's, it's gun regulations and that, that's what is chafing them, or it's whatever. I mean, there are all kinds of different local control issues that you could support, or you could just have generally hold the principles you believe in local control. You know, what are these bozos in Washington, D.C.? I mean, how could they possibly know what the best setup for every town in the country would be? I mean, Texas is like, you know, the size of France. <laughs> Texas alone. And they have to be infallibly governed in every single thing from some bozos who in no way have their interests at heart. So for some of us, that's the issue. It's the overall thing. But whatever it is, I want to share with you sort of what, what my reason is. And my reason basically is, I don't believe in centralized government, I don't believe in the modern state, and 
I have good reason for this position. Let's consider the people who were protesting this event. They basically, without realizing it, they're nationalists, by which I mean, they believe every problem has one centrally administered solution. That's what they believe. That's nationalism. Every problem has one centrally administered solution that will be administered by your overlords who, whose shoes you are not worthy to show. If they decide this is how it will be, then how dare you? How dare you suggest it could be done any other way? And yet, when we look at this, is this always how human beings arrange their affairs? There's one irresistible central institution dictating to all of society? No. This is a modern development, and I do not mean that as a compliment. To the contrary, what we saw before the modern period in Europe, and the reason Europe became free, was precisely because it did not have one single imperial capital dictating to the whole continent. Precisely because it was so broken up into tiny principalities. And within those principalities, it was broken up into little states, or the churches had their privileges, the universities had their privileges, the guilds had their privileges, the towns had their privileges. All these little building blocks whose symbiotic relation gave rise to the society itself all had their own liberties that could not be overridden by the central authority. Today, on the other hand, we believe that this would be chaos and anarchy. Why, why, why? Without Joe Biden having his paternal custodianship over us all, where would we be? That's the view that people have got. We've got to have one single irresistible institution. Well, what has that yielded us? When we got this institution, particularly with the French Revolution, where that was one of the principles of the French Revolution, one, one a great French revolutionary leader said, we cannot concede that French, France is a collection of states. She is not a collection of states. She is a single whole. And if we have any administrative boundaries in this country, they are entirely subservient to the central government. They are creations of the central government. They are subordinate to it. And any so-called liberties they might enjoy can be overridden or canceled or abridged at any time. Well, everyone sort of recognizes, oh yeah, well that seems to be, that's how you have to run society. You know, somebody's got to have the iron hand at the top. That's how you have to run society. But it's not. As I said, Europe did quite well for quite a long time without this. But, and, and what has happened since? Look at the centuries that followed. Look at the atrocities that this institution carried out that any monarch as late as the 18th century couldn't have dreamed of carrying out. No matter what we think about even uh, modern kings, none of them could lay it, levy an income tax on his people. None of them could have carried out the atrocities of the 20th century. I mean, look at the look at World War I. Like of 11 million deaths. This is possible only because of the modern state and its ability to finance these things. No monarch could have gotten away with anything like that uh, prior to the 20th century. Or we look at the atrocities that were carried. I mean, even during that war, starving three quarters of a million Germans to death. No one remembers or cares about that because Germans are, are not one of the officially approved groups in the world, so they're, so they're fate of them, but it never matters. And we go down, we look at all the lists. We look at uh, totalitarian revolutions in the 20th century. Could not have been carried out without the mechanisms of the modern state. The concentration camps, Siberia, police states, all of these things. And then the, the lesser matters, the bureaucracies and the debts that are likely to bring down much of the developed world. And not to mention that these large states, for all their blah, blah, blah about how we help the downtrodden, without us, everyone would be, everyone would be dying in the streets. They can always be counted on to bail out the bigwigs. And yet these people on the sidewalk have the nerve to say that nationalism and the modern state have been a progressive force for mankind. How dare they say that? Don't you love how the progressive, the progressive slogan, question authority, has gone totally out the window. Now it's shut up and obey. That's their new slogan. And whatever happened to small is beautiful. Well, not in politics. 309 million people being infallibly governed from one city is just the right size for these people. <laughs> Think outside the box. The zombie in the video is a parody, not a model to live by. <laughs> All right, now finally, in talking about why it is that I support state nullification, it's not just the historical arguments are sound, that the, the constitutional arguments are sound, it's that the institution it's directed against has done so much damage to the well-being of the American people that it ought to be halted using whatever means possible that are peaceful. And so, since 
late June 2010, believe it or not, I had this book called Rollback that just came out a month ago. And basically the gist of Rollback is kind of building on this. And basically saying, we cannot continue to believe the seventh grade stuff we got in our classrooms. Where you know, the federal government, you know, without them, we wouldn't have any art or science. We'd all be a bunch of stupid doofuses. Um, every kid would be having his limbs blown off because his computer monitor would be exploding, or they, we'd all be working in a mine for 50 cents a week, or something like that. Like, we, I understand the superficial plausibility of these claims, but that is exactly why people go along with giving the federal government more power. They go along with it because they think, well, these people basically have my well-being at heart. Where would I be without them? I'd be at the mercy of these terrible feudal overlords who would be, no, no, no. Okay, we all got that. I understand that. But that has got to be, got to be mercifully uh, overturned after years and years and years of having to endure. I mean, let's suppose kids were not educated in government schools, which most of them are. Let's suppose, but suppose they were educated by Walmart. So every day they go into their, this is my favorite new analogy I'm drawing. They go into their Walmart classroom, and up on the walls is all the Walmart CEOs. And they, they learn to sing songs to the Walmart CEOs, and where would we be without the Walmart CEOs? And, and then they have one day every year, they get off from schools, so they can go celebrate all the indispensable contributions of the Walmart CEOs. Like, wouldn't we find that kind of creepy? Like, wouldn't we say, no, you know what, they might be some good Walmart CEOs, but I really don't think like all the achievements of civilization are due to the Walmart CEOs. You know? But yet, how come when the kids go into the classroom and it's U.S. presidents up on the walls, people believe all this stuff? Oh, good heavens, where would we be without President so-and-so? We'd all be in a ditch, dead somewhere. Like, wh why are we suspending our critical faculties just because some goon is looking up at us? You know, from a, from a, a, a frame on the wall. I mean, I, I, we can't do that anymore. It's not true. The federal government has not been... Uh, has not contributed to our welfare. The progress in our living standards has occurred in spite of the federal government, which instead, instead of, we have a peaceful society here. The federal government pits us all against each other in a low intensity civil war. It pits individuals and firms and industries and regions and, and regions and races and age groups all against each other in a zero sum game of mutual plunder. And instead of bringing about the public good, whatever, whatever that means, it governs us through a series of fiefdoms seeking bigger budgets and more power. And it, yes, sure, it camouflages its real nature beneath this veneer of public interest rhetoric. But it's long past time that we stopped believing it. Because we've got a fiscal train wreck on our hands. People in their teens or 20s or 30s, they're, they're, they're just, they're ruined unless something is done. They are completely ruined thanks to all the impossible promises this institution has made. And, and I'm told it's not progressive to want to stop this thing. You've got to be kidding me. This is the most progressive thing properly understood, you can imagine. And I'm going to leave you with a story I've been telling the past few times I've been in public. I want you to remember this, because this was one of the things that really turned on a light bulb for me. Uh, because this institution, uh, it never applies the rules that it applies to everybody else to itself. Never. It is a rule unto itself. All right, but let's suppose we did apply the same moral rules to the federal government that we apply to you and me. And the story runs like this. These are my words, but the ideas come from Robert Nozick, the, the, uh, the late Harvard philosopher, from his book Anarchy, State, and Utopia. And what I'm sharing with you is called The Tale of the Slave. And it proceeds in nine stages. They're all short. And it runs like this. Let's imagine, first, you are a slave at the mercy of a brutal master who forces you to work for his purposes and beats you arbitrarily. Second, the master now decides to beat you only for breaking the rules and even grants you some free time. Third, you are part of a group of slaves subject to this master. He decides, on grounds acceptable to everyone, how goods should be allocated among you all. Fourth, the master requires his slaves to work only three days per week, granting them the other four days off. They can do as they wish during their free time. Fifth, the master now allows the slaves to work wherever they wish. His main caveat is that they must send him three-sevenths of their wages, corresponding to the three days' worth of work they once had to do on his land every week. In an emergency, he can force them to do his bidding once again, and he retains the power to alter the fraction of their wages to which he lays claim. Sixth, the master grants all 10,000 of his slaves, except you, the right to vote. 
They can decide among themselves how much of their and your earnings to take and what outlets to fund with the money. They can decide what you are and are not allowed to do. We can suppose for the sake of argument that the master irrevocably grants this right to the 10,000 slaves. You now have 10,000 masters or a single 10,000 headed master. Seventh, you are granted the freedom to try to persuade the 10,000 to exercise their vast powers in a particular way. You still do not have the right to vote, but you can try to influence those who do. Eighth, the 10,000 grant you the right to vote, but only to break a tie. You write down your vote, and if a tie should occur, they open it and record it. No tie has ever occurred. <laughs> Ninth, you are granted the right to vote. But functionally, it simply means, as in the eighth stage, that in case of a tie, which has never occurred, your vote carries the issue. Nozick's question is this. At what stage between one and nine did this become something other than the tale of a slave? Now, this is, this is not answered. It's not even raised. Because we have accepted as an unexamined premise of society that we can't function unless there's a single coercive institution with the unlimited power to lay claim to our resources. And although it does throw the poor a few scraps, in a thousand and one open and covert ways, this institution enriches various elites at the expense of the productive population. The more it grows, the worse it gets. More and more of society concludes that they too must enrich themselves by means of government-granted privilege. Everyone begins to clamor for subsidies. The industrialists take, the farmers take, the scientists take, the military establishment takes, the social workers take, the education bureaucracy takes, everybody takes. This is what Frederick Bastiat called legal plunder. No one considers it legitimate to stick a gun in his neighbor's ribs and take his stuff. However, we are taught to believe that a dramatic moral difference separates that kind of direct stealing with the indirect kind, that is, when the government sticks a gun in your neighbor's ribs and hands the proceeds to you. Notice I put it like this, when you tax away from someone the fruits of five months of his labor, you are in effect taking away five months from him. You are taking away part of his life. This is forced labor by any reasonable definition of the term. really the most humane way human beings can interact with, with each other? Is it so unthinkable to imagine a society in which we finally put the guns down and deal with each other on the basis of reason and compassion rather than force? <laughs> I have three minutes if I use my extra time, so I'm going to take like two, two, two of those. Now, I understand that if we take a position like this, and we support state nullification, which I support again because I feel like it's one way, out of many, it's not we don't have to put all our eggs in one basket, but it's one way to stick a finger in the eye of the people, you know, of our wise overlords. And that is, that's fun in and of itself. <laughs> Even this is a big stick in failure. The panic on the face of Chris Matthews on, on MSNBC makes my job all the more worthwhile. <laughs> So I know that the usual, that the establishment won't like it. They're going to smear me and call me names. Meanwhile, you know, they, they, they roll out the red carpet and wave incense in front of the, the complete sociopaths who govern us. Those people are fine. I'm terrible because I think maybe 309 million people don't have to be governed in exactly the same way. That makes me completely outside the spectrum. I know we're not going to be supported by the establishment. But in a way, that's what makes the, this whole movement so appealing, is that somehow we all got here even though nobody in Washington told us to do this, hardly anybody on the radio or TV told you to do this, and yet somehow you found this thing. This couldn't have happened 10 years ago, and it's happening now. The federal government, you know, they, they talk about all their, people are so concerned about the Constitution, and my gosh, what we're proposing is unconstitutional. Well, I've argued that it's not unconstitutional, but isn't it interesting that our opponents, they're suddenly so concerned about the Constitution, not 99% of the time when the federal government is running roughshod they're concerned about when we say, hey, stop doing that. That's what they're worried about. Hey, stop doing that. Oh, my gosh, the earth is going to break free of its axis and go spinning toward the sun. If a state says, no, go shut. But that's what we need to do because the federal government, the federal government, how has it gotten away with all this? I mean, like, 
clear, like as I show in nullification, if you go through the general welfare, the commerce clause, the necessary property clause, you look at what they were supposed to mean, they don't mean the federal government can do anything it wants, but they do that anyway, and they just get away with it. You wonder how they get away with it, the answer is they just do it. They just do it, and then they turn around and they say to us, hey look, we just did this. We just did this, now what are you going to do? What if we think the unthinkable and do the undoable, and turn the tables on them and say, you've been getting used to doing this for quite a long time. What if we, the peoples of the states, get away with something, and we make you guys in Washington live with it? That would be change we can believe in.